you have made so far a mark you have made in your field i leave the floor with dr kunte for the benefit of all the participants of this webinar over to dr kunte please thank you sir for the introduction um, and thank you uh, uh, thank you the department for inviting me to give this talk it's a pleasure to uh, give this talk because i'm going to talk about some of the most exciting projects from our lab uh, largely published in the last couple of years and this is uh, a lot of work uh, driven by my phd students and i'll mention who those people are uh, both during the talk and uh, at the end so um, i designed this talk as a way to show what you can do in a field where not much work has been done before but how you can take a beautiful fauna like what we have in india and then ask interesting questions that will uh, lead to a lot of interesting biological understanding of what is going on in uh, an animal group in butterflies in uh, my case and i'm going to use today's talk and all the work that i'm going to present uh, from my lab as a means to demonstrate what we have to do in india if we are going to make progress in biodiversity studies and also if we are going to get ourselves not only to catch up with what many other uh, countries and many other regions have done using insects but also lead in some of these studies so with that i will start my presentation just give me a minute um i will to start my slide show okay can everybody see my screen and the cursor yes sir it's just coming up good and uh, yes, am i perfectly audible yes sir okay good so um, i'll start with that so the title of my talk today is biology and diversity of butterflies and uh, as has been pointed out i'm at the uh, national center of biological sciences center of tifr and uh, my lab has been active here for more than 8 and a half years now and we have worked on indian butterflies predominantly but we have also done a little bit of studies on uh, cicadas some uh, dragonflies and damselflies and a few other groups of insects but primarily our lab works on uh, butterflies which is what i'm showing here and of course we work we are situated here but we work in this larger biogeographic context with a lot of diversity that spread across himalaya and northeast india which is where we do a lot of work and i'll speak a little bit about that and uh, we have a very thriving group of uh, students and collaborators working with us with whom we have done uh, a lot of this work so if you're interested uh i've given my email address at the end and you're welcome to contact me so the reason why uh, i came back to india at the end of my phd and then postdoc was that i grew up in india of course and uh, i've been watching nature since um, early 90s really late 80s so it's been nearly uh, 33 34 years since i started uh, doing naturalist in india and i feel very deeply connected with uh, the biology that we have to explore here with all this wonderful biodiversity and this rich na natural heritage of course provides a lot of opportunities to uh, do ecological and uh, conservation studies which was something that uh, was very attractive to me and india uh, especially at that time had a lot of promise and that was uh, attractive to me as a young scientist so when i joined uh, one great advantage of working in india as probably most of you know is that we have fairly easy access to all of this biodiversity which not many biologists working in their countries with the kind of scientific uh, establishments that we have some good universities and institutions that we have along with the natural heritage usually if you look across the world you will see that either you have great biodiversity and forests and grasslands and mountains but then you don't have too many good institutions right uh, next door where you can organize all your research or you have great universities for example in western uh, europe and north america but you don't have great biodiversity nearby uh, at least not way close to where uh, most of the institutions are placed but there are some really nice field stations where uh, facilities 
exists. For example, the Smithsonian uh, uh, Institution's uh, field station in Panama. So we don't have to struggle with that. Biodiversity is all around us. And uh, if you just drive out of your city, just for an hour or two, you have access to wonderful landscapes and still a lot of wonderful uh, uh, biodiversity. So with that, I have been focused particularly on butterflies, simply because the uh, species diversity you see there is simply stunning. We have more than 1,400 species, and I'll have a slide about that shortly. But it's not just the number of species. It's also the diversity in other dimensions that these butterflies show. For example, they have very diverse wing patterns. They have very diverse biology. India is not uh, a coherent landscape, a very cohesive landscape in terms of climate and uh, uh, biogeography and uh, other influences on organisms. It's a very heterogeneous landscape. And that has uh, helped butterflies diversify along with other components of biodiversity. So I like butterflies uh, with this advantage of both great diversity and uh, a great diversity in species, and also a lot of diversity that's functional and wing pattern and other uh, kinds that you could uh, uh, put into different kinds of bins if you're uh, going to classify diversity. So that is what uh, we have been doing. Another great advantage of butterflies, which will come up again and again, in the uh, studies that we have done that I'm going to present today, is that um, you can bring butterflies back to the lab. You can breed them. You can uh, uh, have a nice collection with which you can do a lot of genetic studies, uh, phylogenetic studies. You can do a bunch of studies that are going to be hard. So a biologist once remarked that butterflies are at this golden point where they're large and uh, show enough to be attractive to a large population of biologists as well as uh, other people, but small enough to be uh, almost treated as a, a model species, uh, as a workhorse like a Drosophila. So it has the advantage of, advantages of being charismatic, being prominent, you can study their populations just like of birds and mammals and plants, but small enough to be model organisms for lab work and genetic work as well. So that is really the main advantage uh, Advantage that really attracts me to study of butterflies, along with the fact, of course, that I grew up really loving butterflies. So Excuse me, sir. Yes? Sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I request all the participants, please mute yourselves. Thank you, sir. Sir, could all you right. please present the presentation in full screen mode? I am in full screen mode. Uh, so we can't see the full screen more. Yeah. Yes, sir. Let me see. So we can just see your PowerPoint thing. Okay. Uh, PowerPoint thing meaning? Sir, uh, the PowerPoint window, we can't see the slideshow as such. We can see oh, the slide. Okay. Yes. Let me, just, let me just log on from another computer as well so that I can see what you see. For me, okay, it was sir. just the uh, screen. Thanks for pointing okay, that sir. out. Everybody, please bear with me. I'm just going to uh, log on to another um, screen so that I can see what. And for the time being, I'm also going to stop my video because I want you to uh, look at the slide. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I've just logged in with um, another screen and let me see what I see. Okay, fine. Now let's see whether we'll show the slides now. Okay. Um, uh, 
I'll stop presenting for a minute so that I can put on the correct screen. Okay, now you can see the slides, right? Yes, so now it's perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so in case you have missed some of these slides, I'm just going to quickly go through this. So this was the opening slide. I showed this uh, uh, a nice collage of various biodiversity. We have in India various components. And then I talked about butterflies. This is just so you appreciate uh, uh, all these beautiful butterflies that I'm uh, putting up here. Um, and I was on this slide uh, when uh, we had a short interruption. So um, I mentioned that butterfly fauna of India is really diverse. Uh, if you look at the world, uh, there are more than 18,000 species. And this was an estimate from uh, uh, 2011. After that, many more species have been described. So you can, uh, the latest number, of course, there's no constantly updated list. But uh, I would suspect that with uh, taxonomic splits and new species descriptions and so on, we'll have probably uh, uh, more than uh, 19,000 species, probably close to 19,500 species by now of butterflies. So out of that, about 7.5% occur in India. Uh, so in India, we have 14,031 is what I've shown here. That's the latest list that I have. Uh, but I suspect that we have more than probably 100 uh, species to be discovered in India, either as a result of uh, the factors that I've listed here, taxonomic revisions, which will uh, perhaps show that some of the subspecies that, we, uh, that are listed right now may be treated as species. This is a taxonomic change which has uh, taken place again and again in a number of birds and some mammals in India. So that's a very common pattern that you see because taxonomy was done very differently early on. And with uh, uh, modern evolutionary biology and systematics, as well as uh, phylogenies uh, or phylogenetic systematics, a lot of understanding is being changed with these new methods and new information that is coming out. So that's the first factor. The second thing is there are going to be range extensions into India. A lot of uh, species which should occur and do occur in Northeast India and Eastern Himalaya really have not been recorded uh, very well or at all. And therefore, we keep recording new species for India, even if they're known to science. And of course, the third thing, which is probably uh, going to pick up pace, is descriptions of new species for butterflies. This, of course, happens a lot for dragonflies and damselflies, for beetles, for all manner of other insects, but not so much for butterflies because uh, there are not enough uh, competent taxonomists working on uh, uh, butterflies in India or even outside uh, taxonomists working on Indian butterflies. So that is a major uh, bottleneck right now. We have a lot of butterflies, but not enough people to study them at a level where the world is. And that is a big problem, mainly because uh, we are lagging far, far behind. Not that we don't have the tools, not that we don't have the expertise in uh, uh, a small group that exists, but that uh, expertise needs to expand quite a bit. So the uh, numbers I've given you here are different from, let's say, what's given on Wikipedia and some other lists which have been published in the last 10, 15 years. Unfortunately, most of these have been uh, uh, copy-paste jobs from a lot of older literature without really assessing uh, species and subspecies status based on the evidence that already exists. And this number, as I mentioned, is changing almost every month as new discoveries are made. And I suspect that in the next 20 to 30 years, we are probably going to reach 1550 to maybe nearly 1600 uh, species of butterflies for uh, India the politically delineated India as it is right now. So it's going to be a lot of new species compared to what is known right now. And a lot of people keep believing that there are, you know, 1300 something butterfly species in India. But I'm going to show you a few examples how that is a 
fairly gross underestimate because people haven't caught up with a lot of modern literature and people haven't looked at uh, uh, museum resources historical important specimens like pipe things on and so forth so i'll speak a little bit about that later on uh, in my talk but here are the numbers you will see that western arts have about 336 species give or take some because uh, taxonomic um, status of some of the subspecies will change in the future in the near future in fact andaman nicobars have few species 229 give or take a few but that uh, fauna is really interesting and really important from conservation point of view because a lot of those species are endemic so western arts also have substantial endemism at species and subspecies level but andaman nicobar islands especially nicobars have even more so it's a smaller uh, fauna but a really important one and of course the most number of species are found in himalayan northeast india majority of them in eastern himalayan northeast india so it's a stunning number but if you again look at how much do we know about all the species and what goes on it's unfortunately not a whole lot another feature which has been uh, under appreciated in india is that uh, most of the biodiversity hotspots that we have in india most components of those biodiversity hotspots really act as uh, um, uh, as if they were in islands and these are habitat islands sometimes not necessarily oceanic islands western ghats and sri lanka for example have been uh, isolated from other evergreen forests in northeast india and southeast asia by of course the ocean but also a lot of dry areas in central india in peninsular india so western ghats and sri lanka sri lanka has an oceanic island of course and western ghats is a habitat island himalaya uh, is not so much of an island but it uh, its elevational gradient certainly uh, makes it uh, fragmented into zones and there is not very easy movement across the elevational gradient and because of that uh, between let's say highlands of khasi hills or uh, naga and manipur hills versus let's say uh, eastern himalayan or arunachal pradesh and so on and so forth so we have this beautifully fragmented land but we are just the western uh, edge of this very large set of um, very large set of uh, biodiversity hotspots with great endemism as well as species diversity and this in fact in southeast asia is one of the densest clusters of biodiversity hotspots so what we see in india has been highly influenced by very strongly influenced by the biogeographic processes as well as diversification patterns that you see in southeast asia and this is something that has been neglected quite a lot uh, for indian butterflies it had been for a long time in india in general but recent work especially in reptiles and amphibians and uh, a little bit on birds has uh, started to change that perception quite a bit and as i mentioned i really consider india as a land of habitat islands we have amazing mountains some of them really really large and uh, they create uh, some some of the most formidable barriers for indian wildlife and indian uh, biodiversity we have of course some of great rivers like brahmaputra and ganga which are two big ones but of course in the south we have several more which cause uh, isolation especially of less uh, mobile groups such as amphibians and uh, let's say um, odonates uh, perhaps not so much in birds and uh, butterflies but of course there is some diversification over there and of course we have oceanic islands andaman and nicobar islands like sri lanka in uh, south asia which has led to a lot of diversification within this so these biogeographic barriers have contributed significantly to isolation and diversification uh, for mobile groups like birds and butterflies you see about 5 to 8% of endemism depending on where you draw a line between species and subspecies a lot of this will change especially for butterflies going forward for birds a lot has already changed in the last 20 to 30 years but for butterflies and several other groups where subspecies concept has been used i suspect that we will uh, see an uptick in the number of endemism at species level as taxonomic revisions take place and for of course less mobile groups such as uh, amphibians and odonates the endemism is 70 to 80 percent which is quite awesome so with this um, very interesting setting in india at the same time having this very significant proportion of biodiversity in the indian uh, uh, subcontinent and especially in india itself 
Um, we have been in the last few years hammering this mantra and we have been working really hard towards making progress. So the mantra of our lab, which is called Biodiversity Lab, is observe, collect, inspect, and sequence. And this is sort of bringing uh, uh, work on Indian butterflies in the 21st century. And most of this vision was uh, published in a book chapter I published last year in the book called Indian Insects. It was a tribute to uh, the work and life of uh, Professor Virakumat, who was a, a taxonomist in uh, US, University of Agricultural Sciences here in Bangalore. And he still is active. He still goes to the lab uh, once in a while to the collection once in a while. And he is one of the most inspirational uh, taxonomists and insect biologists in India. So this book was dedicated to his work and this chapter came out in that where you will find more details of this in addition to a history of uh, species um, discovery in India. So you can read up more about uh, all of this in that chapter. Uh, so what does this observe, collect, inspect, and sequence mean? These are four major activities that our lab has been involved in, and we're trying to uh, uh, train as many people as possible in all these aspects so that uh, this cutting edge biological research with butterflies gets more uh, uh, widespread in India. And we see slightly uh, better quality science being published from India, especially when it comes to ecological and evolutionary sciences, which unfortunately still is pretty basic in India in most parts. There are only a few isolated institutions and labs which are doing cutting edge research, and I would really like to uh, like that to change. So with that um, view in mind, with that uh, sort of ambition in mind, I put this down in this book chapter. So very simply, by observe, I mean we have to go to the field, we have to look at all sorts of things from life histories to behavior to ecology. And a lot of those things also have a large bearing on uh, conservation issues that butterflies and other uh, biodiversity elements face. It is related to some uh, physiological aspects, basic population ecological aspects, genetic aspects, a whole uh, list of uh, things that you can look at, which are important either from the science perspective or and or conservation perspective. And ideally, you should be making progress in every single one of these. If you look at some of the uh, more developed countries in terms of what is known about their faunas, you will see that the thing that which makes a big difference to what is known and the sorts of questions that can be addressed in those areas, in those countries, is that they have tremendous amount of information on uh, natural history of any group of organisms that is being studied. So butterflies, for example, we need a lot of information on early stages, Bavalos plants, associations with ants, and then parasitism from parasitoids and things like that. For butterflies, we need to know where adults feed, um, what kind of other resources do they use, how uh, does courtship happen, what sorts of uh, sensory modes that, that they use in uh, courting and choosing their mates. Many of these things start with very basic, very simple, uh, but incisive natural history observations in the field, and I'll give you a few examples. So we need to be in the field a lot. We need to note down uh, our observations quite a bit. And of course, we need to uh, collect specimens, especially uh, if you're working with insects or plants or other organisms where collection is a little bit easier. Of course, you will need collection permits from the forest department to do this, uh, unless you're working on non-scheduled species outside protected areas and so on. But we really lack uh, very good uh, research collections in the country, especially modern ones, where you have uh, DNA libraries, where you have geo uh, reference data for every specimen and so on and so forth. So reference collections are really, really solely, miss uh, solely missing in India. And most of the resources that we have in this particular area are really strong outside of India. Most of the collected specimens, uh, uh, most of the Indian specimens, I should say, are, for example, in the Natural History Museum, London. They have more than 10 million specimens of butterflies and moths in the world. It's a tremendous collection, uh, the largest uh, collection of Lepidoptera so far. Uh, a large uh, proportion of uh, specimens are also in the museums in Paris and uh, Berlin. 
there are other collections in uh, uh, florida for example and a variety of places some in japan some in other places most of the recent collections that exist outside of india are illegally collected specimens and exported illegally without permits from national borders to authority and so on which is a big problem that we have to tackle but we can only tackle it well if we build reference collections and good facilities in india and i will mention our report in this uh, area we of course need to curate these specimens really well we need to use modern databases online databases which can be easily seen by a number of uh, people who are not even associated with those research collections so in other words make our collections more easily accessible we need to have frozen tissue libraries for molecular work and again i'll mention our efforts in that area uh, i think on the next slide we also need to repatriate data uh, photographs specimens from uh, museums abroad bring uh, all sorts of uh, database and label information uh, to india and again that's something that we have been involved in uh, for the last 10 years and that's turning out to be a, a quite an important resource for our community and of course inspect uh, our science doesn't stop uh, only in what you do in the field but we do need to uh, look at uh, all the materials that are available to us if you can do some of these things in the field great but otherwise a lot of this can be done more rigorously in uh, the lab in a research museum and that is i'm emphasizing this especially because in india people just do not have this conception that a lot of good science needs to be done on our wildlife on our biodiversity in museums and labs not necessarily in the field you can of course do certain things in the field you should do certain things in the field but that science doesn't stop there and under that it, uh, you, we have things like let's say morphology uh, variation and morphometric so for example looking at uh, wing shape analysis or doing wing shape analysis to look at evolution of flight for example in our butterflies uh, evolution of color patterns in different uh, areas for example do color patterns vary in their brightness in their u in other uh, features if butterflies are current forest areas versus grassland versus some other habitat does it change in urban landscapes versus rural landscapes versus uh, natural landscapes and so on and so forth so there's a lot of this uh, work that can be done with museum specimens uh, and unfortunately most of us do not have access to good museums like let's say natural history museum in london so we have to start building these resources in universities research institutions and central uh, uh, repositories like let's say zsi or uh, iri in new delhi and in our case in ncbsd have a very nice collections going which is producing an enormous amount of data and papers and of course uh, one major reason why we should be collecting and not only go to older collections but of course specimen collections is uh, a modern uh, sequencing work with which we can do population genetics uh, uh, molecular phylogenetics a whole bunch of uh, things including looking at uh, allelic variation in our butterflies looking at uh, uh, using that to study anything between adaptations in color in behavior in other aspects to conservation genetics for example and to do these things you really need modern can go to museums you can get some sequences from old materials but it's very very challenging the um, technology is still at a preliminary stage that right? from 100 year old specimens it's still very difficult to get good genome level data whereas if you have specimens a you get uh, geo reference data you get uh, fresh material from which you can look at for example color patterns which is always better done in uh, more fresh specimen or at least well curated well preserved specimen which you do not always see in a lot of uh, older indian museums if you go to collections of let's say forest research institute in dehradun or uh, uh, zsi uh, the national collections has wonderful collection but a lot of specimens do not show colors as they were when butterflies were collected fresh because of the methods that we used to preserve these butterflies the chemicals that we used to preserve these butterflies just paint the colors or change the colors in a manner in which you cannot really use them for a lot of ecological and behavioral studies so fresh collections are useful from that uh, point of view in addition to of course doing all the molecular work
So this is in essence our observe, collect, inspect, and sequence strategy to make rapid progress uh, with modern biology centered on butterflies as the model group of organisms. All right. So that is a very long introduction which I wanted to give precisely because in India it just blows my mind how basic our understanding of sciences uh, and uh, biology of butterflies is. And that really saddens me because most of the papers that come out of India uh, even now are still things like, um, uh, you know, checklists of this area and checklists of that area or two to five months of work on, uh, let's say, comparing butterfly uh, numbers in one area versus another, uh, let's say, a degraded forest versus a good forest and things like that. And you can learn a lot from that, but we really need to go beyond these basic questions. And if you want to count butterflies, great. Do it at a much bigger level. Ask questions at a much bigger level. And that is something that I'm going to try to do in uh, this talk with three things. I'm going to first mention uh, how we could study diversification and endemism of Indian butterflies, uh, going beyond just listing species. The second thing I'm going to talk about with uh, two examples is uh, how do we make progress in understanding the biology of species and not just how many species occur where. And that understanding has to lead to something uh, useful either in terms of uh, what is a big uh, deal in terms of the scientific discovery, and of course, uh, what we can use that information to conserve species, for example. So those are two examples that I'm going to use from uh, our studies. And of course, the third thing is, how do we conserve our butterfly diversity through education and citizen science? So I will uh, uh, very briefly uh, tap on, uh, recap on what I mentioned, butterflies is a representative group, and in terms of uh, understanding diversity, some aspects of taxonomy are really up outdated. We need to uh, uh, make progress on that. We need to understand biogeography and systematics really well to make uh, progress. We need to understand species and uh, subspecies names and uh, synonymy really well, so that we have a very nice understanding of what we are studying. If you're studying populations, then you would need to understand what a population is of one species. So we need to um, make sure that we are choosing the right species to study. And of course, for that, we need current distribution, population information, and so on. And we need to develop a major program in modern entomology and biology of insects. And of course, I'm going to talk more about butterflies because the situation there is actually a little bit worse. Uh, than, let's say, what uh, we know about, uh, let's say, Oroneta, which uh, has been studied really well compared to, let's say, butterflies from taxonomic perspective and systematic perspective. K. Subramaniam at Zeresa has done a lot of uh, that work recently. All right. So with this in mind, uh, what I started doing uh, soon after I joined uh, NCBS and started my lab was that we started collecting um, materials from a number of Indian states. So we have now collaborated with a number of state forest departments and local NGOs and other institutions so that we both train people uh, locally and also, of course, uh, uh, do a lot of work in these areas. And we have uh, slightly more than 40,000 specimens by now, representing more than 1,500 species. We have your friends data and deep frozen tissue libraries for every single species that we have collected. And we are involved in a lot of evolution and phylogenomic data and phylogenomic research with the materials collected. Uh, you can see the quality of the specimens. This is uh, one of the best collections in uh, India, one of the best modern collections of butterflies in India. And we use the same uh, curation protocols as those used in uh, Atlantis Museum London, who kindly uh, let us borrow those curation protocols. So we have these things organized really well. We are in a um, climate control facility, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. We have more uh, than 170,000 specimens uh, by now, actually, with some latest papers, about 55 new species of insects, uh, only a couple of butterflies, but more uh, butterflies and moths, but uh, uh, other insects as well, odonata, cicadas, uh, and so on. 
So we are building all these resources, which are uh, going really well. We started our research collections in 2013. Uh, as I mentioned, we have really excellent protocols. We have a database uh, of all the specimens that we have so that we can find specimens very easily. And of course, we have our uh, decoder libraries which make all the molecular work possible. And this is facilitating uh, four global collaborative research projects. And I'll mention those in, in a little bit. Um, we have currently more than 65 scientific publications which have come out of these research collections in the last five to six years, especially, which is awesome. It is very difficult to see that kind of uh, uh, an impact on research output, and especially uh, with some modern uh, work on molecular systematics as well as uh, ecology evolution and conservation. And among the major collaborators, we have a, a memorandum uh, of understanding with Zoological Survey of India in Kolkata, Natural History Museum London, Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, Maguire Center at, uh, for Lepidoptera in uh, University of Florida. And I'll be giving a talk there uh, tonight at 7.30 um, uh, Indian Standard Time. If you're interested, please join there. I've already posted about that on Facebook and Twitter, uh, or rather, the organizers have. And I'll probably put up a link uh, soon so you could join that uh, in the evening. And uh, University Museum from University of Tokyo. So we have some very strong connections with some of the most important collections as well as research group in the world. And we are part of four NSF funded global collaborative projects. The biggest one, of course, is uh, uh, Butterfly Net Project. Um, and I'm a foreign collaborator on that. Uh, Fireflies is another major project, one on cicadas and uh, another one on amphibians. The amphibian paper is out this in, I think, May or June. It's not out in an issue yet, but it is available. It's a wonderful phylogeny of uh, amphibians, global uh, phylogeny of amphibians, which has uh, brought up some really interesting uh, results in amphibian uh, phylogenetics. And of course, uh, we will start seeing this kind of work in other groups as well. Uh, in the last eight years, we have also uh, cataloged about 13,000 specimens, uh, about 40,000 images as a result. Many of these uh, are type specimens and other historically important specimens, mainly from Natural History Museum uh, London, NHM UK uh, is what you mentioned there, uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology, and of course, Florida Museum of Natural History, Maguire Center. Uh, so this is one of the largest libraries of images of museum specimens, including types, in uh, all of Asia, if not uh, in the whole world. Some museums, of course, have taken this as a single-minded goal to uh, get all the collections accessible and there are online depositories of images and so on and so forth. But for India, this is an enormous effort. And uh, if you ever try to photograph specimens uh, in museums, you will know what a 13,000 specimen catalog looks like and that is going to be really useful uh, going forward so i've shown two specimens here these are both uh, from the natural history museum one was collected uh, the one in the lower left corner here butanitis ludlavi that was collected in um, uh, let's see 1936 if i remember correctly yeah and then it was described as a, a new species i think in 1940 or 42 something like that um, and this is a holotype of that specimen. This was collected from Bhutan uh, all these decades ago. And now we have the label data. And these numbers that you see, BMNHE numbers, these are attached by me and my students who have taken all these pictures. So all these things are cataloged, photographed, and now accessible to everybody as we uh, write these up, as we make uh, online depositories for these images to butterflies of India and other uh, web resources. And this is another uh, uh, specimen. Uh, specimen. This is from Chin Hills in Myanmar. This is uh, uh, Athima whitei, which was a species not known from India earlier. But one of the first sightings of this butterfly was a picture that I've taken, I think, in um, Mizoram, if I remember correctly. And then uh, other people had uh, have taken this from other parts of Northeast. And uh, uh, this is... Uh, this is the sort of images that we have here. Of course, this Athima YTI is the upper side. This is the underside. For every single specimen, we take up pictures of upper side and underside. 
and close up of the labels so that all of that information is captured and this is in addition to the about 40000 specimens that we have in uh, 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 climate control facility at ncbs and of course issue in minus 80 uh, degree freezers in ncbs research collection so it's a massive amount of resource that we have collected that we have amassed really and this is what we are using for a lot of taxonomic uh, revisions uh, using you know going back to old taxonomic literature looking at museum material including notes unpublished notes and manuscripts and databases from museums and of course we have been involved in a lot of dna sequencing molecular phylogeny and systematic revisions and this is going to change a lot of uh, uh, higher classification as well as species and subspecies status in many lycenids and hesperids these are two groups where uh, incorrect assignment of genera and incorrect assignment of subspecies to species is uh, unfortunately quite widespread and that is something that we are trying to change here is an example of uh, what i meant earlier uh, as an example of copy and paste culture in india what you see here are different species of uh, a particular genus called halpe historically these have been treated as, as different subspecies of the same species called halpe homolia and its genitalia are drawings uh, made by evans as shown here and these are the distribution of uh, distributions of these uh, seven species that i have shown here um so what you see here is uh, that a most of these are allopatric some of them are sympatric in the northeast but if you look at the genitalia for example each taxon each what was considered to be a subspecies has a very very different uh, uh, class or uh, valve which males use in uh, uh, during mating which males uh, use to hold on to the female during mating and this is a very important uh, uh, trait which helps different sister species separate out from each other so this is the sort of evidence which has been out there for nearly 70 years now but people really haven't looked at that and this is again from the book chapter that i mentioned earlier so we are going back to this kind of information which has been out there reevaluating species and subspecies status and that is the reason why the number of species that i had listed earlier was much higher than what we would uh, uh, see for a lot of other um, in a lot of other papers and books that uh, you might refer to but what we are using is really uh, updated information and reevaluation of the evidence that is out there and of course we are actively generating a lot of that uh, evidence okay so that was uh, brief about uh, what we are trying to do to understand how many species are there how are they distributed where are they distributed are they endemic uh, how much genetic divergence do they have how much morphological divergence do they have from uh, sister species or from other species in an ecological context and so on and so forth but of course we are not just taxonomists we are biologists in general and now i'm going to use two examples as what uh, we have been doing with this kind of information as long as morphometric information uh, for example that i mentioned earlier that we have been generating so the first story that i'm going to talk about i'm going to talk about two main uh, biological studies by the way the first is going to be on migration and flight morphology and physiology and the second one is going to be on um, uh, what is called thermal melanism which is relevant to thermoregulation and in uh, a modern um, world of course uh, impact of climate change which um, are are already serious and of course this uh, thermal melanism that i mentioned has uh, a significant bearing on how organisms are going to adapt to climate change so the first story was led by my phd student uh, vaishali bhamik shown here and the work that i'm going to talk about is from three papers an old naturalist paper uh, i published in 2005 and of course two recent papers led by vaishali uh, published in ecos and biology letters in the last two years and uh, species that i'm going to talk about are denine butterflies they are milkweed butterflies they shown here this is the common uh, crow this is double banded crow double branded crow blue tiger and dark blue tiger and what you see is that these butterflies have uh, a very prominent 
uh, migratory behavior in southern India. So the yellow arrows here are pointing towards east and northeast um, from the Western Ghats. So these butterflies move away from the Western Ghats just before monsoon, as I mentioned here, these are pre-monsoon migrations, which take place from April to June. And then you have post-monsoon migration happening sometime between October and November, depending on uh, uh, when monsoon sets in and when it withdraws. And then accordingly, when is a good time for butterflies to go back to the Western Ghats and breed there. So this is uh, the general migratory movement. I'll go into the uh, details of that a, a little bit more. But both in this old uh, uh, JBNHS paper as well as the recent paper in Nikos, what we realized was that across these four species, uh, the abundance of different species varies. The commonest species are, of course, the brand, uh, uh, dark blue tiger and double branded crow. And then common crow is also common, but blue tiger is not that common in these migratory swarms. And this is not, of course, the total number. The total number of butterflies which migrate is in uh, millions of butterflies, if not tens of millions of butterflies. And of course, when numbers are so large, a precise estimate of number of butterflies is hard, especially if we don't sample in, across multiple uh, areas of uh, South India. But that's something perhaps that we should be doing at some point. Uh, but this is across the specimens that we captured and uh, uh, sex as well as identified for these things. So these numbers come from that uh, data set. And this is, as you can see, more than 3,000 specimens, which is a lot of specimens. So we have really, really worked hard to build this kind of uh, information. So among these, the number of old individuals uh, that you see in the third row, number of old individuals is really small which means that most of the butterflies which migrate are freshly eclosed. And uh, the sex ratio in these is, uh, again, quite variable. It's never exactly 50-50. And we don't know whether that's because uh, males and females fly at different heights, but we can, of course, catch butterflies closer to the ground, or whether uh, uh, the sex ratio is actually genuinely um, uh, in favor of males than in favor of females. So that's something that we do need to uh, see. And then, of course, we looked at number of females that we sampled, meaning we uh, captured them. We looked at their uh, number of ova present, and of course, if they were uh, ovulating and if they had mated. And almost none of these butterflies, none of these females were mated. They had not, uh, they were not carrying a sperm at all. And very few of them were ovulating, which suggests that these butterflies undertake migration before they mate and before they become reproductively active. Very interesting. And the fact that it happens across four species, the same way in every single species, is quite interesting. Maybe these butterflies use common uh, climatic uh, factors, features, whether temperature, day length, whatever it is, maybe onset of uh, pre-monsoon showers. We don't know exactly what cues they use, but they seem to be in sync with each other and with some climatic factors so that they are all in reproductive dipoles, all in the same reproductive phase as uh, uh, every other species. And based on these data, we have reconstructed this um, migration cycle in these butterflies and a lot of observations from our group as well as uh, observations contributed by citizen scientists have um, supported this migration cycle. So what happens is that, of course, you have pre-monsoon showers between April and June in different parts of southern India. And uh, these uh, southwest monsoons drive these butterflies out of the Western Ghats. You will see them hanging out in Mysore area for some time. And when pre-monsoon showers reach that area, they move to Bangalore. And when pre-monsoon showers are in Bangalore, they move further east to uh, the eastern plains. Um, and while they're doing it, they're in reproductive dipods. So the orange uh, arrows are reproductive diposes, and then purple arrows here are uh, uh, reproductively active butterflies. So the reproductively active phase in non-migratory uh, butterflies. So after they migrate east, they are in what we call post-migratory swarms in reproductive dipoles, meaning that these butterflies have reached some destination. They might rest there for weeks. Uh, and sometimes perhaps even more than a month until showers again push them further east. 
and during that time there is no courtship activity there is no mating and then there is no eggling so these butterflies are in reproductive dipoles and they swarm together you don't see one or two butterflies here and there you will see them in large clusters of thousands of butterflies if not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of butterflies these are spectacular sights but then the butterflies in a few weeks break their reproductive dipoles start laying eggs and then generation which grows from the eggs laid here uh is of course in the area where they have migrated then there is change of generation and the northeast monsoon uh showers hit and before that these butterflies move out of the um, eastern plains and eastern hills and they have a reverse migration towards the western ghats not the same butterflies though the next generation moves back to the west ghats which is amazing in case of birds we know that the same birds go back and forth year after year as long as they live whereas in this case it's alternate generations alternating generations which uh, move in the opposite directions uh but the northeast monsoon uh, before the northeast monsoon really these butterflies move out of the eastern plains and hills they again have a post migratory swarms in reproductive dipoles in the western ghats and then they start breeding and then of course this migration cycle continues now this is something which is based on some data but it's very preliminary data we have just captured butterflies looked at their uh, ovulation and the number of eggs that they carry and so on and so forth and from that we were able to reconstruct that but can we do a little bit better can we learn something about the biology and the physiology and the uh, migration itself of these butterflies so vaishali uh, did a very nice study using this idea that butterflies allocate to different body parts in a different way and um, what we know from previous work by uh, uh, and, uh, pink and sigley from 1980s they published a beautiful set of uh, uh, papers showing that these things do differ along with center of mass which is related to allocation to different body tissue in different species groups for example models and mimics uh, uh, in a mimicry ring have very different uh, allocation to body parts and what we have recently uh, observed that male and female of course have very different uh, contribution to thorax versus abdomen for example and thorax versus abdomen is a good comparison because thorax is largely muscle mass which powers the flight and uh, abdomen is largely reproductive tissue and therefore the butterflies have to make a choice between investing in uh, flight versus investing in body parts and penchant so these work for example had shown that butterflies invest much more in thorax and flight and escape behavior if they are not uh, chemically protected whereas they invest much more in uh, abdomen in reproduction if they are chemically protected for example long wing uh, butterflies heliconius in uh, uh, in south and uh, central america invest a lot in abdomen compared to thorax relative to thorax uh, we should say so we are looking at a ratio between thorax and abdomen similarly many other toxic butterflies invest more in abdomen compared to thorax whereas in uh, uh, palatable butterflies let's say common baron um euphalia acanthia for example that entire group invest massively in thorax very little in abdomen even in the female compared to other these toxic species and of course males invest even less in abdomen because they don't have much in their abdomen females at least have a lot of eggs you'll often see that female abdomens look fairly swollen as a result um so what uh, vaishali did was he went out and uh, uh, caught a lot of butterflies and measured investment in uh, different body tissue especially for at an abdomen of these butterflies which are migrating or dispersing and then we asked whether reproduction um, Uh, has any bearing on migration or vice versa and then of course how migratory behavior and flight morphology are related to each other and therefore we can look at the mechanics of how migration actually happens so our uh, hypothesis for example was that males as we know are going to invest less in abdomen they are going to invest some in thorax so if you look at thorax mass on the x axis and abdomen mass on the y axis and measure these in uh, uh, milligrams so you are taking mass actual mass actual weight of these two body uh, 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 body um, elements 
So what you're going to see is that males are probably going to lie somewhere in the lower right corner, meaning that they'll have certain uh, uh, thorax mass, but very little, uh, very small abdomen. Females could uh, differ from males either in having the same thorax mass, but much higher abdomen mass, meaning that their flight apparatus is just as powerful, but they're still going to be hampered by the number of eggs they lay, and therefore their abdomen is heavier, uh, and their um, wing loading is different uh, from that of male. Wing loading is a, um, is a ratio of uh, body mass divided by wing area which is uh, wing loading is basically a flight kinematic parameter which determines how fast an organism can fly or how fast any uh, flying body can fly. An airplane has the same uh, wing loading idea as let's say a butterfly or a bird or anything else that can fly. So it's a very well-known um, flight kinematic parameter. So uh, this is really important the proportional uh, differences between abdomen and thorax. In other words, flight versus, I mean, reproduction versus flight and the impact it has on flight dynamics. Females could also have smaller thorax and larger abdomen, and therefore they might differ from the males in being in the top left corner rather than top right corner. Yeah, And of course, females could have uh, a smaller thorax and perhaps uh, just as big an abdomen as males but the relative proportion is still going to be different as a result. So we had these three predictions in how males and females might differ based on the migratory behavior. So Vaishali uh, looked at the four species that I mentioned earlier, common crow, double-branded crow, blue tiger, and dark blue tiger. And in each one of these species, you have orange being ovulating non-migrating females, green being migrating females which are in reproductive dipoles, and blue being males. And in males, we did not see any difference between migrating and non-migrating butterflies. So we have just plotted them together. Whereas you do see a significant difference between how females invest in thorax versus abdomen in these two different phases of migration and reproductive dipoles. And what you notice here is, and it's clear here, but I'll show it here because it's even more obvious. Females which are ovulating and which are uh, not migrating have a much bigger a much bigger abdomen compared to females which are migrating or males in reproductive mode. Yeah, so females in general invest much more in reproduction compared to males. But if you look at the thorax, the thorax is not that much different from either females which are not uh, which are migrating or males uh, in either migratory or non-migratory phase, which suggests that females don't really change their investment in thorax. They change their investment in abdomen in relation to uh, uh, in relation to migration. So what they do is that during migratory phase, they enter reproductive dipoles, as I mentioned, all the migratory butterflies were in reproductive uh, uh, dipoles, females were not mated, they were not ovulating and so on and so forth. As a result of that, what you can see here again and again is that the migrating females and the migrating and non-migrating males had much more similar ratio of abdomen uh, to thorax compared to migrating females which had a much uh, 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 i mean uh, compared to ovulating females which were in reproductive mode the orange uh, uh, data and the orange uh, regression line that you see here and that is uh, where females are investing much more in uh, reproduction in abdominal tissue including in eggs and fat bodies, which are important in uh, producing a lot of eggs. So this is a fundamental shift in uh, uh, investment in different body parts based on what butterflies do during migration. So reproductive dipoles, migratory behavior, and uh, flight morphology are correlated. In other words, uh, morphology, physiology, and behavior are correlated in these uh, in these. In, in this particular uh, phenomenon, and that helps butterflies lower their body weight, lowers fem uh, helps females particularly lower their body weight, so they, they can fly more efficiently during migration. And mind you, these movements are really, really long. Butterflies can fly for anywhere between uh, 300 to 500 uh, kilometers, for example. And that's a long flight for such a small insect, which has to power its flight 
using uh, uh, wing muscles and the whole flight apparatus. And then there is wind, and there are all sorts of parameters which might hamper their flight. So at least to not carry a burden of eggs, these females enter diapause and they migrate. And this is now important. Remember this particular aspect because it's going to come up in the next few slides. Here, migration is dependent on uh, the Indian monsoon. Butterflies move out of the Western Yard just before the Southwest monsoon uh, hits. And that is because it's a torrential rain in the parts of Western Yard and uh, Malbar Coast, right? After the monsoon starts, parts of the Western Yard don't see a bright, hot sun for three months or more than three months. So during this period, butterflies cannot really function in these areas. Uh, not definitely uh, sun-loving butterflies like uh, milkweed butterflies. So they move out of that. But then southwest monsoon comes every year. There are there are a there are years when the southwest monsoon fails or is delayed quite a bit or arises uh, quite early. But it happens every single year. And the plants, uh, parasitoids, predators, other insects. Everything is dependent on the onset and withdrawal of monsoon, right? So there are these cycle, uh, seasonal cycles which happen every year, and therefore there is some regularity in how uh, butterflies have to move out of a very wet and inhospitable area during the monsoon. And uh, uh, where they go in the eastern plains, what is the kind of um, climate they're going to face there? So there's some predictability in the environment. And that helps it helps these butterflies uh, undertake yearly migration in the same direction and perhaps from same uh, starting point to end point year after year, decade after decade, and perhaps uh, millions of years. Um, so this is a very interesting thing that we have learned that butterflies invest less in reproduction than in reproductive diapause when they migrate, and that males and females differ in their uh, uh, reproductive diapause and investment in different body parts. And this is something on top of what we already knew, even elsewhere. So it's not just that we have learned something interesting about our Indian butterflies, but we have learned something interesting that every scientist will appreciate in terms of what does their ecology mean to how they invest in these, uh, in this flight of virus and so on and so forth. So that was a nice study, but then virtually, um, uh, compared that with other species of non-migratory denines. And in these butterflies, the patterns are similar. Females invest much more in reproduction, so their abdomens are heavier, and their thorax to abdomen ratio is greater uh, in males because they have small abdomen, uh, large thorax, whereas large abdomen and small, relatively small thorax in females. So the ratios of uh, thorax to abdomen are usually below one in females and usually above one in males, and the migratory females which are in reproductive diapause fall right in between. They're neither like reproductive females nor like males, but they're uh, in many cases fairly close to males. And uh, of course, in non-migratory species, you don't have that category. So that's a very interesting behavior, but what Vaishali found further is that if you look at other toxic butterflies, denines, liquid butterflies, for example, are all uh, toxic butterflies. So we compared that with other toxic butterflies, this Tony Coster, um, common windmill, and then uh, Indian uh, Jezebel, for example, those three species are shown there. So these are non-migratory aposematic species, meaning toxic uh, species, warning, warningly colored species. And what you'll see is that the reproductive strategies investment in reproduction versus uh, flight is similar between other aposematic species as it is in non-migratory denines as well as migratory denines if you ignore migration because we are uh, only looking at non-migratory uh, data here. But here is this intermediate phase which has evolved in relation to, in response to uh, uh, the seasonal climatic fluctuations which are um, prominent in the West Nard. So that is pretty cool. That is a very, very nice result that uh, Vaishali was able to uh, present. Now what happens in uh, dispersing species? And by dispersal, we mean, again, this is explained a little bit better in uh, our paper given here. This is biology letters published just last month or two months ago, something like that. Uh, 
And that again turned out to be a very nice paper. And the way we have defined and differentiated dispersal from migration is that dispersal is a resource dependent, unpredictable movement. You don't know when a local population is going to finish off its marvelous plants and will have to move to another patch because they just don't have any lavalos plants in which to lay. So they are either going to crowd their uh, caterpillars on really, really uh, low resources, or they have to move somewhere else in search of lavalos plants and breed in those areas. And for this particular study, we studied two species, lemon immigrant and model immigrant, uh, Capsilia pomona to the left and Capsilia pyrantha to the right. And uh, these are driven by uh, capturing seasonally available ephemeral resources. So these butterflies feed on plants which have leaf flushes, meaning that in certain seasons they will put out a lot of fresh leaves and those leaves are palatable only for a short time. So these butterflies have to quickly go to these uh, areas with fresh leaves, legs on these plants, the caterpillars have to quickly finish those plants. And because of this peculiar uh, feeding frenzy, they often end up uh, finishing off most of their larval plants, with the result that when the butterflies come out of uh, the, those uh, uh, caterpillars and the UP that happen, uh, as, that, so as the metamorphosis takes place, the resulting butterflies do not really have very good dis plant resources on which to uh, lay it. So they have to then move on, and that is what causes these dispersals. So what you see here is that uh, in any one season, Pre-monsoon dispersals here are in orange, and then post-monsoon dispersals are in blue here. And you will see that in each season, butterflies are flying in all directions. These are all uh, dispersing swarms reported by uh, various citizen scientists, as well as uh, data gleaned by Vaishali and I. So we have we see that in the same season, butterflies fly in different directions, meaning that as they finish local lavalos plants, they just take off in a swarm in some direction and then they, I suppose, land in a place where um, they will settle down legs and their caterpillars will feed there. So using this information, again, Vaishali used the same approach. She looked at thorax to abdomen ratio. Again, as a reminder, thorax is investment in flight, abdomen is investment in reproduction. And what you see here is a completely opposite pattern to what we saw in denines. Here, butterflies in reproductive dipause uh, I mean, sorry, not reproductive diapause. I forgot to mention one important thing. What we discovered when we were looking at caropsilia in immigrants is that they are not, they do not enter reproductive diapause. They breed continuously. And this is where I uh, said, remember that uh, denine migrations happen as a clockwork with monsoon. Every year they will happen. And there are two-way migrations, um, plainsward migration during uh, uh, the pre-monsoon showers. And then, of course, return migration to the Western Guards uh, after Southwest monsoon. These are unpredictable migrations. Butterflies cannot really predict when they are going to finish off the plants and where they will have to fly. And therefore, uh, when butterflies eclose from their pupae, uh, these immigrant butterflies, they have to be ready for reproduction. There's no time to wait to enter dipoles, to break dipoles, and then start breeding. If they try to do that, there are going to be other females which are going to be uh, laying eggs and caterpillars from those butterflies uh, are just going to finish up all the plants and then your own uh, caterpillars are going to starve and die. So they really have to be ready as soon as they close from the uh, pupae and then they have to start moving. So because of that, what you see is again and again in migratory, in dispersing butterflies, the non-dispersing butterflies have... Um, greater thorax to abdomen ratio, meaning that they have uh, heavier thoraxes compared to the abdomen and dispersing butterflies uh, have lower thorax to abdomen ratios, meaning that their abdomens are heavier. Whereas what we saw in denine butterflies is that the migrating females have uh, heavier thorax, uh, not heavier abdomens. Here it's heavier abdomens than heavier thoraxes. And this, is, this was a surprise to us, which was also uh, why this paper made it into a prominent journal. Because when butterflies are flying, you would imagine that their flight morphology is going to be such that it is going to aid the flight. It's going to make long-term dispersal facilitated. Whereas what we see is that because of this resource-driven migration, 
that I mentioned where resources have to be exploited right away. There's no time to uh, enter and uh, break dipoles. So these butterflies are flying in a state of reproductive readiness. And they're still not mated in most cases, but they have to quickly mate and start laying eggs in a new patch where they find uh, larvalose plants. So their uh, reproductive dynamics in non-dispersing uh, and dispersing mode is again different from what you see in other non-dispersing and non-migrating species. That was another interesting thing. And what that tells us is that um, these butterflies invest in different body tissue very differently based on what their biological requirements are, what their reproductive dynamics are, what their competition is like on these larvalose plants. And that has a big impact on how these butterflies have evolved and the life history strategies that they have developed. Uh, all right, I just uh, um, mentioned uh, stuff on the last slide. So this particular work, uh, Vaishali's work came out of having developed this new way of measuring uh, insect morphology. And we have measured more than 8,000 specimens of nearly 2,000 species. And this is a beautiful data set with which we are doing a lot of uh, other work now in insect morphometry. Uh, so various papers will start coming out in the next two, three years, I think. So I'll switch to the next story. And I'm going to be a little bit brief in this since time is short. Um, uh, this is a work that Shubham Gautam, my master's student, and I did. And it was just published recently. This is uh, a butterfly called Pieris Kennedy, Asian uh, cabbage white, in which uh, you see that there's a lot of variation in how the dark scaling on its upper and underside. And this butterfly is found in the Himalaya and in parts of the Western Ghats with occasional records elsewhere. But it's really a, a, a cool area butterfly, which is the kind of uh, climate that you see in the hills. So this is where it occurs the most. And it has a fairly wide range, 300 to 3,000 meters. They wanted to know whether uh, this type of melanism, which has been shown to be related to thermoregulation, uh, temperature regulation in butterflies. Uh, so we asked whether this variation in melanism is random. It's completely individual variation. There is no structure in how this variation um, uh, is partitioned into different success seasons, elevations, and wing surfaces. So that was the first thing we wanted to check. And then we wanted to know if uh, uh, this structure exists. Does it uh, pro provide predictions? Uh, does it support uh, predictions of thermoregulation or anything else? And what we saw was by sampling across the elevational gradient in winter and summer months, and using our RGB values from Photoshop, what we found out was that this variation is highly significantly structured across six seasons, elevations, and wind surfaces in a way that suggested that it has role in thermoregulation. So it's a case of thermal melanism is uh, uh, what has been a phrase that has been used in the uh, past. So here on the x-axis, you, you have sex, female and male. And then on the y-axis, you have degree of melanization. What you see again and again is that summer butterflies are less melanic, meaning that they're whiter, because of course you don't need to have that much uh, pigment uh, to capture a uh, warmth of the sun compared to let's say winter months. And in a lot of cases, uh, you will see that this is upper four wing, upper hind wing, under four wing, under hind wing. In many cases, you will see that uh, females are more melanic compared to males. In some cases, that uh, variation is not significant. In other cases, it is significant. But females typically have slightly more melanic coloration compared to males. And uh, this, again, showed uh, a clear impact of thermal melanism, uh, a clear impact of climate uh, on thermal melanism across this elevation gradient and seasons. And this is, again, you see. Females are more uh, demanding in their thermal uh, uh, requirements. And this is not our work. This is something that has been known from both in uh, Nearctic and Palearctic, as well as some uh, neotropical areas. And that is apparently what you see in our butterflies as well. If you look at males and females during the summer, they more or less have a similar melanism. But of course, they are uh, more melanic at higher elevation compared to lower elevation, because the thermal requirements, uh, body temperature, uh, 
getting it up to a level where they can be active is of course much more challenging in uh, uh, at higher elevations than it is at lower elevations but the females and males have much more uh, um, uh, much paler wings in the summer much darker wings in the winter which is what you see here a substantial difference between the two seasons and here the females are significantly different from the males so at the limit at the physio physiological limit in the season where temperature matters a lot during winter you see that female and male variations are much more different compared to let's say in summer when uh, ambient temperature is not as much of a challenge as it is uh, during the winter so this is a very very interesting uh, uh, outcome and this is a very exciting uh, uh, outcome it shows that climate impacts uh, Two types of all kinds in Indian butterflies. First, with um, Vaishali's work, I showed that the monsoon is affecting reproductive dynamics and uh, investment in different body structures in butterflies. And with Chubham's work, I have shown you how you can look at impact of climate. In this case, cold climate across an elevational gradient. And we are now looking for students and postdocs to take up this project. The uh, work that I mentioned that Chubham has done. on impacts of climate change on butterfly biology so if you are interested please drop me an email here is my email address and uh, we can discuss possibilities of what we can do so with that i will stop i'll mention that uh, we do a lot of citizen science work as well we have a beautiful website called uh, butterflies of india a lot of data are coming through that will most likely cross 1 lakh uh, reference images on this website it's a massive database of all sorts of things related to butterflies so feel free to use it and certainly uh, contribute to it it's just going to make work on indian butterflies uh, uh, that much nicer there's a lot of information on uh, early stages on distributions on lavolos plants and nectar plants that butterflies use and so on and so forth and uh, i will not talk about the rest i will just thank my students uh, very quickly uh, these are uh, some of my phd students as well as others who i have to oh, wait i think you can all see this just a minute i think this presenting broke so let me just stop presenting and restart it um it appears that my presentation uh, permission has been revoked so uh, somebody from pondicherry can you um give that permission again i'm getting this uh permission issue i don't know what the matter is so we'll let the administrators know yes okay actually i will keep talking since time is short so um i will just very quickly uh, mention my phd students who have done most of this work and have been fantastic of course uh, all my funding agencies especially dst and a bunch of collaborators um, uh, through butterflies of india consortium as well as uh, people in different museums who have collaborated with us so uh with that i'll stop uh, i'll put up my lab website on uh, on the last screen whenever i get permission to share the screen i'll do that um and we have some time for questions perhaps 5 or 10 minutes so uh, i'll open this up for questions so you have the permission to share the screen sir okay i'll just and uh, now i'm There's something wrong, and I don't quite know what that is. But that's okay. My presentation Thanks. is over, so we can forget about sharing the screen. 
I'll just start my video so that uh, you can see me as I answer your questions. Okay, sir. thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for providing us with insights into the world of butterflies, their distribution, and your work related to them. Again, I remind the participants that a recording of the seminar will be uploaded later in the day on our YouTube channel. Now we can go ahead with the question answer session. Uh, I think I'll move from the bottom. Uh, the first question is from Blue Planet Warrior. Uh, did floral inflorescence and scent, chemical volatiles, evolve parallelly with evolution of pollinating behavior in insects or lepidopterans in specific? So not enough work has been done in uh, butterflies uh, in this area as let's say what has been done in uh, uh, bees, for example, and in some of the moths. In moths especially, scent has been uh, studied quite a bit and uh, uh, there's a lot of other experimental work done on moths as well. In butterflies, largely people have shown that uh, certain colors uh, of flowers attract butterflies much more. Uh, and that seems to vary from uh, area to area depending on habitat and so on and so forth but at least some correlations with color have been shown and some work has also been done on butterflies showing that uh, nectar uh, volume as well as nectar concentration is really important of course like all other uh, uh, nectarivorous insects you can imagine that uh, time is always short and butterflies have to feed in the shortest uh, possible time uh, and take up nectar as much as is required for their daily activities and also investing in uh, uh, reproduction and flight and everything else. So um, a certain concentration, typically if I remember correctly, is something like 15 to uh, 30, 40 percent uh, sugar concentrations have been shown to be most attractive to butterflies. And of course, sugar volume, nectar volume rather. Uh, is important. More the nectar, better it is for butterflies. Uh, but a combination of this nectar volume and uh, uh, sugar concentration in the nectar is what really matters. So there's some chemical work, not enough though, I think, and certainly nothing in India that is uh, uh, that has got to a certain international level. Several people have tried to do this and some people, some groups have done a fairly good job of uh, quantifying which uh, species of plants attract which kind of butterflies and so on and so forth. But there's very little experimental work and there's very little work uh, on um, scent, a combination of scent and nectar uh, qualities. I think um, um, Rene Borges' lab in uh, CES had done some work on insects, including on butterflies and uh, flower properties and floral visits. And uh, one of our students, Vita Gauda, is now doing uh, a bunch of work on pollination. Vinita, as far as I know, doesn't work on butterflies so much, but at least she works on pollination and uh, she, her lab has done some good work. So maybe look up their work. My lab hasn't studied uh, this in particular. When I was a graduate student, I looked at what is the effect of proboscis lens on nectar uptake by butterflies, but that was in Costa Rica, not in India. Uh, some of Vaishali's work will now start showing uh, that kind of patterns but we haven't published that yet. But yes, the uh, relationship between nectar plants and butterflies is really important for species which feed on flowers. And you can imagine that everything from reproductive dynamics to dispersal is influenced by availability as well as quality of nectar patches. And with um, another collaborator, uh, Anuj Jain, we published another paper, this one from uh, um, Singapore, so some of the species that we studied uh, are common between India and Singapore, but the study was done in Singapore and that also shows uh, how nectar plants uh, both help, but also sometimes trap butterflies, especially in urban areas. So you, sh you should uh, look up those studies. My early work from Costa Rica was published in 2007 and eight, I think. And those papers are available online. And of course the recent work from Anu Jain and his collab his uh, advisor along with me that is also available on uh, uh, online so you might want to look that up uh, thank you sir the next 
Yes. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sujit Prajapati. A geographical distribution or range extension is how much how important in context of butterflies? Can you repeat that question again? Geographical distribution or range extension is how mm -hmm. important in context of butterflies? Um, so I suppose you're asking in the context of biology of butterflies, not just in terms of how many species we see here. And range extension is essentially how we uh, think in evolutionary biology, uh, how populations expand to new areas and how new species uh, are also formed. So new areas could be either, uh, either an island system or a new area could be a distant area of uh, uh, a mainland uh, in a different part of uh, the mainland though from the previous range so as populations expand into space with these uh, things what you see is that um, these populations will have some physical distance between them uh, we call that uh, uh, simple geographical distance but then there's a difference between uh, uh, just plain distance versus functional distance so in um, now, population biology, and especially in modern uh, branch of population biology called metapopulation uh, ecology, uh, a matrix, habitat matrix is not uniform, right? You have patches of favorable habitats in the ocean of unfavorable habitats. So when we uh, measure uh, distance across uh, suitable habitats, it's just not a straight dis distance between those two habitats you have to go through the unsuitable matrix, matrix. And if there are mountain ranges uh, in between or reverse or any other kind of barrier, then you have to go around them, not over them. And therefore direct uh, straight distance is not useful in an ecological sense, but the way butterflies have to move through the landscape is what is really critical in that sense. So uh, if you, if butterflies end up being in areas where uh, the physical distance is really not important, but these barriers and this uh, uh, dispersal through matrix is more uh, influential, then you might see that uh, butterfly populations get fragmented at least seasonally or yearly or long-term, hundreds of years, thousands of years, that kind of thing. So if you look at uh, these uh, different geographical aspects of how populations are connected, and then, of course, depending on how much butterflies can fly, how much they do fly, and uh, other relevant uh, parameters, you can uh, see that butterflies, uh, butterfly subpopulations often mix or not. And wherever there is more uh, separation between populations, you will expect that either through random genetic drift or through local selection, you're going to start seeing two populations move apart in space. For example, what you see in a Himalayan population of a butterfly versus a population that of the same species, which occurs in Andaman Islands, they're at, at the least going to diverge in for what part of the year they're active. In the Himalaya, they're going to be active only for a few months. In uh, Andaman, since there's good climate for butterfly breeding and uh, regular activities, daily activities year round, you're going to see butterflies perhaps flying all year round. and breeding continuously, unless their lavalose plants do not allow that, something like that. So you can see that uh, this kind of ecological features, ecological differences between different populations, isolated populations will start pulling these populations apart in their ecological properties, and slowly when their uh, genetic composition. And that will, of course, lead to speciation across these uh, uh, different populations over these barriers. So dispersal is very much important both uh, to uh, occupy areas and therefore uh, in, expand niches of these species and also uh, eventually in diversification and speciation. So the next question, uh, the next question is from Rahul Ranjan. Mm -hmm. How study on butterfly migration is useful for the non-scientific community or the general public? Well, I, <laughs> I really don't have to explain that much. Everybody loves butterflies. And even if you do not hear about 
the biology of butterflies everybody certainly enjoys looking at butterflies and if they can't go to the field at least looking at them uh, uh, online or wherever you can so from that perspective i think butterflies enrich our lives by just having this very interesting uh, um, sentiment about butterflies if you are not really looking at anything scientific but actually i will not make this clear distinction between purely uh, aesthetic versus scientific because conservation in some sense falls in between conservation is a scientific problem it's also a societal problem and um, it has things like development uh, human uh, development of human populations and societies and things like that so those things are very much integrated in what we do in our daily lives so that is really what ties us to things that we may not see species that we may not see and from that perspective i think study of butterflies is really important because butterflies shed really useful light on um what we know about their behavior about their populations about dispersal the challenges that they face in uh, uh, going from a habitat patch to another and the dispersal and migration work that i mentioned uh, done by vaishali is really important from that perspective it shows that if habitat becomes fragmented then butterflies uh, in fragmented habitats are going to suffer but females are going to suffer more than males because they have to find these patches where they can breed right if they don't find a good patch they are not going to be able to make it and because in these dispersing species they have to fly in a state of reproductive readiness they are going to actually end up wasting a lot more energy going across uh, further uh, patches and in an un uncertain uh, landscape and that might uh, affect their population persistence in the larger landscape so that is a very important conservation uh, implication which should concern all of us and that's also something that we can all help for example if we uh, create small pockets in the cities either through uh, parks or even uh, your backyard gardens where butterflies can breed if you plant uh, the lavalos plants the nectar plants then we at least create small pockets where butterflies can briefly rest uh, feed perhaps even breed for a generation or two before they can find uh, further patches to breed uh, uh, in a in a more natural setting so if you can create this sort of uh, more a slightly easier landscape for insects to move about then i think that will be really useful and that is something that even non scientists can participate in in fact they can do much more than what scientists can do because you will have a lot more impact on what your city is going to do than let's say a handful of scientists if people demand that their parks be improved for uh, improved as butterfly habitats if people demand that a certain area be declared as a wildlife sanctuary as a butterfly sanctuary then of course the government will listen to that a lot more because ultimately government is there to serve people so as non scientists i think you should absolutely pay attention not because butterflies are cool and colorful and they make you happy but also because it's our responsibility to help them persist in the landscapes that we are influencing and in, uh, in many ways controlling so anyway it's uh, 3:40 so officially we should stop i'm happy to continue this and answer some more questions if you like but uh uh on the charity team if you want to officially close this so that you can move to other programs that you may have i think uh, um, you should do that properly and thanks again for inviting me um, i've been meaning to visit pondicherry for a long time and I, after the pandemic i will hopefully uh come there and interact with you guys and of course with everybody else who joined online outside of pondicherry as well um um go to butterflies of india definitely participate and if you are a researcher or a research student definitely drop me an email if you want to either get trained or come and work in my lab you're welcome and i'll be happy to see more people uh more students who want to do good science want to make a difference both with good science and with good research uh in conservation areas i'll be happy to uh, talk to you thanks again thank you sir you are most welcome to our university it will be an honor to have you uh, uh, if participants still have unanswered queries they can mail sir directly he had provided the email address and we will uh, otherwise you can mail us also we will pass them on to sir
and you can find the link to our youtube channel and our email address in the chat as mentioned earlier uh, at last i propose the vote of thanks i i thank dr krishna meek kunte sir for this wonderful talk i would like to thank the faculty coordinator professor n parthasarthi sir for being with us i extend my thanks to professor jay kumar hod department of ecology and evs pondicherry university and dr gurjeet kaur ma'am for joining the talk i also thank the audience for the interest and patience throughout the meet thank you everyone bye this is a reminder to all the participants please fill up the feedback form to get the certificates thank you